So just to get us started, I want to make sure that folks have had a chance to look at the Code of Conduct. You've probably said that you read this when you registered for the conference. Um, has anybody not had a look at the Code of Conduct? I think we're a thumbs up, yeah, um, unless we need any microphone. No, we're good. Um, there's also an attached anti-harassment policy, which is worth perusing if you haven't done so recently. Now to this part. Um, so what are we going to cover today? Um, these things. So, so, sorry about that. So the idea here is to um, talk about uh, obviously managing Sanvera-based projects. So we're going to go through what to expect when managing a project and what additional challenges you face when you're managing a project that is attached to a community-driven um, open source software uh, community. Uh, so there's some differences there that we'll go over. Um, we're going to go through a whole bunch of touch points for engaging with the community on different topics. Um, and that's going to be followed by a break. Uh, and then after that, we'll have a big, long activity, which will be very exciting. Um, I'm excited about it. Um, and then after our activity, we will um, talk a little bit about working with stakeholders and users, um, specifically getting user feedback and managing expectations with stakeholders and users, um, and then looking at uh, local requirements versus community feedback, and there's another activity embedded in that, that part of the um, day. This is still me. This is still me. I'm just going to put this on. Yeah. Like I'm some kind of professional. Can you? I'm not a professional. <laughs> All right, let's try that. Is that good enough? OK. Uh, <clears throat> so what do we expect kind of generally when we're managing a project or service? I think a lot of the folks in this room are project managers or service managers of some kind. Um, and so maybe these things are apparent to you now. Um, so when we're trying to manage a project or service, we try to think at the system level. So how are all the elements of the project or service working together or not? Um, uh, we try to focus a little bit on adaptability. So um, when the environment changes or the technology or the expectation changes, how do we adjust to those changes and make changes to our service or product um, to continue to meet the stakeholder needs? Um, we also try to think about uh, resourcing for our projects. I'm sure we all have way more resources than we need, and so this is typically <laughs> like that problem where you're trying to like give people work to do because they don't have enough to do. Um, so how many, re how many resources do we have to do a project? Um, and how can those be utilized best? So this gets into timelines for projects. This gets into swapping people out in your organization from this project to that project, because we oftentimes have lots of different projects going on. Um, and then user expectation management. So the project manager or the manager of a service is typically responsible for communication with users, managing their expectations, um, which is challenging, uh, harmonizing the communication from the stakeholders and users with the development team um, so that Everyone is kind of speaking the same language, so there's kind of a translation piece we all tend to play uh, in that role. So how does this differ when we think about working with the Sanvera community? Um, so there are extra layers of things that we have to do when we're, when we're engaging with the Sanvera community. So we have to interact with the community, or we don't have to, but it's, it makes sense. <laughs> it helps it's advised. <laughs> I will assert that it helps to interact with the community. So talking to other uh, Sanvera uh, implementers, um, asking questions, going to calls, meetings, and workshops, going, coming to, to things like this. Um, tracking and anticipating community activity, which is really challenging at times, but important. So um, you know, if, you're, if you and your project are thinking about building a special thing, um, it probably pays, and we'll talk more about this later, to uh, Try to look around the landscape and see who else might be interested in building that thing and see if you can work together or at least leverage each other's work 
um, so that you're not doing all the work yourself. Uh, and planning local releases based on communities schedule. The schedule there is in quotes for a reason. Um, scheduling is hard uh, for everyone um, and the St. Barrett community is not uh, excluded from that difficulty. Um, so if you have your product being released soon or you're, or you're upgrading your, your product for some reason, pay attention to the schedule of say Hyrax if you're a Hyrax based project um, so that you're not releasing your new thing like two weeks before a new version of Hyrax comes out and then you're in this kind of catch-up game. Um, so these are sort of the extra layers that we find ourselves overlaying on normal project and service management. Um, so touch points for engaging with the St. Vera community. So we have a lot of different uh, kind of entry points for engaging with the St. Vera community when we are managing projects and services. Um, so we'll talk real quickly about these major touch points. So getting started with Samvera, um, I think there maybe are some folks in the room who are like brand spanking new to the community. Anybody else? Anybody who still feels like they're not sure where to find information? My hand is up here for, for a reason. <laughs> um, and then thinking about where, how or when you engage with the community, when you're building a new repository, when you're migrating data to a repository, um, when you're adding a feature to a repository or customizing a repository. Um, and then uh, uh, the last thing here is um, how do you engage with the community when you're trying to influence the decision making process, which I think is maybe one of the most important elements of engaging with the community. Um, Oh, here's another thing. If you have a question or a comment or just want to like chime in, um, that's great. Just do it. And we have a microphone that really works really well. <laughs> but we can run it around. But please wait for the microphone to get to you because this is being recorded. And um, when I watch this later, because I like to watch myself talking in front of people, I want to hear your questions. Um, OK. so. So kind of the beginner's version of tracking what the heck is going on in the community. These are kind of the, the main venues for communicating with the community or kind of searching for information about some topic that you might, um, you might want to find information about. So um, we have uh, in the community a weekly tech call, which is on Wednesdays, I believe. Wednesdays um, at the what? At noon. At noon, if you are in what time zone? East Eastern. The Eastern time zone <laughs> of North America. So the tech call happens. That's, uh, as you might suspect, primarily a technically focused call. But it, I've found it to be useful to sit in on that call if the agenda includes things that seem to impact my projects at home. Uh, or just kind of um, service or product management generally. Um, Slack, uh, is everybody familiar with Slack as a concept? Anybody not familiar with Slack as a concept? Excellent. So the Slack channels for Sambera are super active, um, and this is a great place to get somewhat immediate feedback or conversation going. So if you're looking for someone, you say, oh, Steve talked about the tech call at that workshop. I'm going to shoot him a Slack message and see if he can remind me what time zone of noon <laughs> was whatever. You, you, you get the idea. Um, but there are Slack channels for, I think, just about every working group and interest group um, in the community. Um, there's a dev channel that's super um, uh, fast moving. Um, and then I think maybe for folks in, in this crowd, there are channels for repository managers. Um, there are channels for most of the major solution bundles um, and things like that. So there are lots of places to keep track of what's going on and get in touch with folks uh, if you have questions. Can, um, I, can I interject something about Slack? Please use this microphone. Um, one thing about our Slack uh, team, the, the Samvera Slack team, is that it is on a free version right now which means that um, it does not keep a history past 10,000 posts. Yes, 10,000 posts. And we, I think somebody, I heard this in the partners meeting yesterday, that last 
week we had 3,000 posts. So we're keeping at best a month's worth of history in the Slack channel right now. This is a known problem that we are trying to solve. Um, but uh, it's just worth noting that if you're looking around Slack and doing some, some uh, trying to get information there, you're not going to see a lot of past history. I just wanted to make sure that was clear to everybody. And we're going to fix that soon, I hope. Um, so we also have Google Groups. There are two, I think, primary Google Groups, Simvera Community and Simvera Tech, and these are uh, these are places where you can go to ask a question and expect kind of a longer form response. So oftentimes when we are seeking community input, we will put a post on, on the same very community and tech space and ask for people to respond. Slack goes by so quickly and people miss questions that maybe take a little bit more thought to respond to or to ask. Um, so if you have kind of like a, a, a longer question it's really useful to place those on the Google Groups because uh, it gives people more time to respond uh, a little bit more thoughtfully. Um, there are a handful of other Sanvera community or Sanvera Google Groups that I'm not even sure what they are. There's like a partners group and maybe like a metadata group. I'm not sure. You can poke around and see, see what's out there. But I'd say these are probably the two primary Google Groups. Um, on the Sanvera wiki, there are a whole host of interest groups and working groups that um, are relevant to just about everything uh, at Sanvera. Two to call out here specifically are the repository managers interest group um, and the migrations interest group. So for folks considering migrating from some other platform to a Sanvera platform. Um, and you can find all of those on the same of wiki. There's also information on the wiki about how to start an interest group or a working group, which is a fairly easy process um, to go through. So if you have a topic that's not being covered by an interest group or working group, um, feel free to start your own. Um, and then issues. So each of those solution bundles or components of a bundle has a GitHub repo. So we do, uh, I think, all of our development work in GitHub. or via GitHub, um, and please submit issues. Um, it's helpful. Uh, we've had many cases where people are creating Google Docs of problems they find with something, and then they always send you a Google Doc, and the preference would be to put it in issues because then everybody can have a look at it. It's an open, open space. Um, does anybody want to say something about these last two points here? Neither do I. So <laughs> we're, we're really going to talk more about these two considerations here at the bottom throughout today. Um, but it is important to, especially this first one, try as best as you can to align the development you're doing at your institution with what's going on in the community. Um, there are a lot of ways to not have to do the work yourself. Um, there are a lot of other people looking to do the same work that you're looking to do. And we really want as much as possible to avoid people kind of striking out on their own um, unless it's you know necessary or that's what they want to do. But we find there's a lot of strength in working together on these projects. Any questions about this stuff? Yeah. So for the um um so for creating issues on GitHub, uh, is there a preference for tagging any of these issues? Like if you know it's an accessibility issue, tag it like that, or if it's a, an internationalization or something like that, or is it just put it up there and we'll figure it out? It, so if you are pretty darn sure what it's about, um, put a tag on. Um, don't go crazy because we have a few people for Hyrax, for instance, who go through a couple of times a week to tag and prioritize issues. Um, we're pretty well caught up on that. So somebody's going to look at it if it doesn't have any tags on it. Um, and, but feel free to throw a tag on there if it, if it is like clear what the thing is about, yeah. I think it might be worth adding that um, there is a, it, sometimes GitHub can be intimidating if you're not used to using it. Um, everybody has felt that, so you're not alone. Um, there is a template in, if you open up a new issue in, uh, in Hyrax specifically, um, so that it kind of prompts you for things to put into the issue. 
and it's helpful. Um, so there's the there's the template, like a, a brief just summary, you know, why why this is a problem, what you would expect it, how you're expecting it to work, and then how it's actually working or just not existing, maybe. <laughs> and then steps to reproduce the behavior that may not apply in some cases, but um, and that's okay. You can't fill out everything. Just do your best. Um, so, you know, I'm trying to like do my best to say why you should engage, but let's talk a little bit about that, right? So, why is it important to engage and participate in community things? Um, first of all, if you're engaged with the community, you have some awareness of what's actually going on. Um, uh, what's the community working on? What issues and projects are emerging or being worked on uh, currently? I just said that. Um, and who has similar use cases to yours and how can you collaborate? I think that last one is super important. Like it's it's fairly easy to very fairly easy to see what's going on with projects, but really important uh, to find out who else is doing something that or wants something that you want to. Um, it's easier to make a case for um, higher acts to make a change if you have six other institutions that want that change too. For, for example. Um, engaging also gives you a hand in the product, right? It gives you a hand in all of these phases of planning, architecture, design, and development. Um, and I would also add um, QA and uh, user experience testing. Um, and learning, right? So we find that people who engage with the community early on tend to ramp up faster in kind of all quarters of this environment, so developers tend to ramp up, ramp up faster, um, product owners uh, or people building some sort of sandbar based solution at their institution tend to ramp up faster um, and have a better sense for what's going on and how to work in the community. Um, and it's community. This is how we do our work. Um, if everybody was doing this alone, we wouldn't really be a community. We'd all be using the same stuff, but it would be sort of lonely. Um, I don't want to be one, so please join us. There are some drawbacks, let's be honest. Um, there's a learning curve, right? We have to meet community standards. Community standards may differ from your local standards um, in development and other things. Um, every community in the world has a culture to it, and it's important to learn kind of what that culture is about. And I don't think our culture is particularly weird or intimidating in, in many ways, but it is kind of its own thing, and so you kind of have to learn how to um, communicate. Um, and, and we have to learn how to contribute, right? Um, and I find, uh, to a certain extent, that developers send, this tends to be a place where developers get stuck really early on, is that the process of, of contributing code back to the community um, has a few more layers than your local process might, and so it's just kind of a matter of learning uh, what that process is. Uh, also, contributing back to the community can be a little bit slower. Um, we have more voices when we're all working together, and so we need to hear more people and their, and their opinions and their thoughts about what people are suggesting to contribute back. Um, this, though, I think makes what we do a little bit stronger um, and more stable, hopefully. Um, and the timing of developments at the community level may not align with local needs. And I think all of those who've had a Sambera project out there um, have felt this this pain of having to kind of trade off your local timeline against whatever the community timeline is. Um, the other thing is that because of all of these things up here, it does take some time away from your local needs. Um, but I, I still think that you get something back from engaging with the community that you, you would get from just going on your own. Um, so just some, some considerations. So let's talk about the next touch point, which is uh, how are you going to engage or how could you engage with the community if you're building a, a greenfield sandbar repository, so a brand new empty repository, you want to stand it up and get it going. Um, so some primary considerations, what are you even trying to do um, that may be apparent that we sometimes start on projects without really knowing what we're doing, maybe we've all felt that problem before. Um, and so when you kind of think about the things that you're trying to do with this repository you're building, there are some fairly obvious places to turn your attention 
um, depending on what you're up to. So if you're hosting AV content, you may want to look at the Avalon solution bundle uh, as a starting point. Um, if you're building a general repository of some kind, um, but you want it to be hosted, um, you may want to look at Haiku or DCE or Notchake or some other uh, um, firms that are out there in the community that are doing hosting for solutions like this. Um, if you're trying to build uh, kind of a gen customized general repository that you're hosting yourself, you might look at Hyrax um, as a starting point. Um, and for any or all of the above options, you may also consider, after you've looked at what's out there, you may want to build your own thing. Um, and that's a totally viable um, option if you have the resourcing to do it. Um, and there are many really successful uh, uh, groups here at this conference this week who have done that. And so there are a few workshops out there or unconference type sessions to, to talk about that. That's the direction you're looking to go. Um, some secondary considerations when you're looking at all of this, what features don't exist or what features exist that you don't like? Um, that's certain to happen. Um, then speaks to going back and looking at what other people are building or trying to modify. Um, you need to consider how big your team is, so back to resourcing. Um, and more resourcing, how much time, money, and patience do you have to do certain things, right? So this is kind of all about looking at the landscape, looking at what's available to you, and looking at what you have to contribute to your own project um, and evaluating um, where to go from there. Questions? Okay. Uh, now it's the two. Any questions so far? Uh, no. okay. um, so, uh, as Steve talked about, um, that if you are thinking of building your own uh, repo or like migrating data or anything, you are at a point that you do have your MVP, which is like minimal viable product, after that, how do you know that what does Samara products, any of the solution bundles offer? So up to this point, we expect that you do have your MVP, and then how do you get to the gap analysis? Can I have a um, show of hands, like how many of you are in that uh, boat that you do have MVP and you're thinking of not many? So is it like, are, are you, moving a, like a repo, are you building a greenfield repository or is it more like data migration? So how many of you are like building a greenfield repository? What does greenfield repository Yeah, that, that's a good question. The question is, what is a greenfield repository? Yeah, I've never heard that before. Is that like blue ocean, like whatever you want? And how many of you are thinking of moving from an old system that you already currently have and then going to that one? Okay, so even for that, you have an MVP that, that would be like, okay, we already have these features. Let's take an example of DSpace. So uh, we already know that DSpace offers these features. So now we have to see what would be the best product or the solution bundle here in somewhere that we can use. So once you know what you want in your repository, uh, solution. These are the few um, resources available that you can uh, go and see, like the Hyrex website. It talks all about all the features that are in Hyrex. At the same time, there is um, down here, Neurex is a hosted vanilla Hyrex instance. So you can actually test drive it. You can you know deposit uh, something there, and then you can see how it works. And you can look at all the features there too. Documentation is uh, pretty good. I would say it's it's not uh, not everything is there, but it's it's pretty good. Um, there was a group that worked on it last year or so. Is that Hannah? You worked on it too. You wanna... uh, I mean, I think there's an ongoing documentation okay. working group that yeah. is, is keeping it up mm -hmm. to the extent that they can. Yeah, and that would be another touch point. There is a working group for documentation, so if you want to get involved in that, talk to them and see. Um, where they are in the documentation process. Uh, there are product owners um, for all the core components and the solution bundles. And then there's uh, this roadmap council, which is fairly new. 
It just started this month. So that would be another touch point. You can um, coordinate with them. So I was jumping back and forth here. And the last uh, thing would be that there are some known higher ed implementations out there. There are some institutions like us at Michigan. We have a higher ed uh, repository, the Deep Blue Data. Uh, so you can, you can go on that link and see uh, who are the other institutions that are using one of those social models. Any thoughts? Okay, so um, Steve talked about building a greenfield repository, and this is about migrating data to a somewhere when. Um, it's kind of similar. There might be a little bit few differences. Um, so um, the touch points would be similar. You can engage with the, the repository managers, working group. Sorry, it's an interest group. So. Um, it's interesting how interest group sometimes become a working group. So it's like uh, there was a subgroup uh, from repo managers work interest group that became a working group. And the working group then delivers something and dissolves. So it's back to interest group are more like ongoing groups. Um, then there's a migration interest group. And there are actually uh, different groups for DSpace to high rights and content DM and bridge to high group. Um, you can even ask questions in all the interest groups. Um, there are migrating tools available, and that's another thing many institutions are working on their own, so it's good to collaborate and see uh, what everybody is working on. I think we already talked a lot about like, thinking about how can we all work together and how can these products be useful for all of us. So um, this is another thing that happened. Let, let's say you started off using high regs, and then you're like, OK, um, when you did the gap analysis, you know these are the features that high regs does not have. So how do you go about adding those features? So one way is that you just build it on your own and then give it back to the community. The other could be that you get involved in the community and work with the with the group, so talk to the product owner, see who else is interested, work with two, three different institutions, like a community sprint, and then that goes back in the solution bundle. Or the third way is that you just wait for someone else to work on it, and then I take that. All, all three are good. I think Steve is the product owner for IREX, so he might say one is better than other. <laughs> but uh, it depends on your situation and resources also. Um, okay, so uh, one thing was like you want to add a feature, then like how you go about that. This is more about customizations. So when we uh, start uh, building our repo using higher eggs, we still need to do customization. Like branding is a big thing, we need to customize that. Or there are a few other things that needs customization. So I mean, this is something that's kind of unavoidable. We do have to do customization. But it's, it's recommended not to do customization so much that you cannot get the updates when Hyrex gets updated or any of the solution bundle get updated. So this is another thing that if you are part of the repo managers group or the other interest groups, this is where you can put it on Slack channel and say, oh, this is how we are doing, how others have done it. There's like configuration way to do things and And if you are considering uh, um, contributing back, then that's uh, the configuration way is, is the best way to go. Because what happens is something that you have added, maybe other institution doesn't need that, so they can just turn it off. And we said that several times, that there are product owners. Yeah, please. Can I Questions? Um, so I was just wondering if you could go, any of you, um, into more detail, especially about uh, things that have been contributed back to Hyrax in a configurable way, because we have some things that we've been thinking about doing that, and we're just like not exactly sure. And even if you had just like examples of things that have previously that's happened with like the flip flop features yeah. specifically, yeah. I can give one example of um, um, like the proxy users. So 
this is something we found out that we don't want to use it all the time, so we wanted to turn it off. Uh, so something like this would be good. All the proxy already comes with Hyrex, but if we were to add a proxy user, or if you want to add enhancement to the proxy user, I would say keeping it as a configurable would be really nice because maybe other institutions don't want that. Do you mean to know like how to do the configuration? Is it like it's in the admin portal? <laughs> I guess a little bit more, a little bit like where to draw the line between like a local customization and something you would contribute back, and then also just like what already are things like like more examples like that. I just like haven't looked through all of them, and I'm kind of curious what people have in the past. Yeah, and ours. Do you want to? So I think some of the things that people have contributed back. Um, uh, so some of the social features in Hyrax, I think, were possibly originally contributed from an institution when it, when we were in Sufia land many many ages ago. Um, things like workflows were, I think, originally conceived by a working group and contributed to Hyrax, but were originally built in a flip-floppable way because a lot of people didn't want them. Um, I think a lot of that's changed now. Um, analytics, so as a, as a way to develop a new analytic, new set of analytics for Hyrax, we originally, um, at least the work that's been done so far was, was um, set up so that it could be turned off so that you wouldn't see the kind of garbage of like the development process going on. It was like garbage, but it's like, it wasn't ready to use, but some people wanted to test it out. And so we, we set that as configurable and, and flip-floppable um, as some examples. Um, there is, I'm gonna go back real quick. There is a place that is helpful to look at. <clears throat> so this is the list of Hyrex impl implementations that Nabila mentioned earlier, and one of the columns in this table uh, includes features that these groups have built for their local implementation um, that I think for the most part haven't been contributed back. So this is actually a place that I go sometimes when I'm feeling lonely. And I look at this and I say, okay, where? look, I have a lot of people who are, um, you know, doing you know, whatever it is. And so let's get those groups together and see if we can work together to, to try to push something like this back to community. Um, is that yeah, help um, more? The one that I see up there, uh, uh, if you, you can just repeat my question, um, work types, um, that's one thing that I was wondering how people are contributing back, and if they are. Work types, how are people contributing back like, on you, work types? Or is it just like documentation, like you could configure it this way for this? So there are actually, so is a documentation, you could configure things this way, work types. So there are a lot of different conversations about work types, and this has been a point of confusion since work types emerged as a concept. Um, and I haven't, I've, I've seen some kind of loose community conversations about how are people implementing work types in Hyrax, which I think is a useful thing to do and useful thing to continue doing. So I'd actually like to see more of that. Um, we also, there are a couple of cases, and maybe um, Chris could talk about this. So in the UK, they've been trying to converge on like an ETD work type. There's like a conversation there about, about that. Is that somewhat accurate? Um, yes, a lot of the conversation. Yeah, the Sambira Europe group got together and decided they wanted to try and work together on development of a work type that we could all then use and meet each other's requirements. And they started with an uh, ETD. Um, now that different people are at different stages of implementation, so it wasn't like everyone was going to go off and implement it. Right. It was about it was more about having the conversation yeah. between like minded people who wanted to be able to generate something that would be of equal value to each other. Right. That makes sense. And I wonder too if the Avalon folks are having conversations about AV work types in Hyrax with respect to Avalon and, and what, you know, whether, whether that's going to like drive a conversation at the community level about here are some good patterns to follow when you're building AV work types. 
you know, I think the intention is to uh, to eventually submit that, as well as a bunch of other things that are being developed for Avalon 7 back into core. Um, some of it goes straight into core specifically for Avalon, and some will be broken out. And, uh, some of the upstream, I think, AV work type is going to be one of those once we get everything sort of settled with it so that it's sort of easy for somebody to pick up and use in the community. Um, but yeah, Chris Coldbar, I'm going to have the last say on that. <laughs> My biggest question about work types was like, how easy is it to pull that out as a component, or how much easier is it just to share your documentation, like your your data model documentation, to have someone else configure it themselves locally? I think at this point, it's probably easiest to share what you've done with documentation and a metadata application profile or whatever, yeah. and then That's what we have a doing. conversation. And I think this would be a great on conference on Friday morning. Yes. Yeah. Unfortunately, I'm leaving, but you guys. Should Okay. <laughs> That's a great idea. So this would be a great topic for repo managers group as well. So, and um, that is that meeting happens once a month, uh, but you can put it on the agenda on uh, for that group because there are the institutions, and I mean we are always looking for topics to discuss in that group. So this would be really good to talk about there. And if there is a lot of interest, then there could be a working group formed from the that group too. Jessica has been waiting patiently for her question. It, I was impatient. Does anybody else have a question? <laughs> Interesting. Uh, uh, my question was on track changes. Is there a, a, a best practices for tracking changes for customizations? Is it documented somewhere? Could I read up on it? Are there talks about it that I could be listening to? I got nothing. That's a really good question, too. Yeah, again, I think that's a good conversation to start, probably. Um, and maybe I, I more like, for a technical, you know, more of the core developers right, audience. Right, and maybe feeding that info back to repo managers so we have a sense for what we could be doing. Any other thoughts or questions? OK. So I think that's where we were. We already talked about this. Are you all familiar with uh, with these groups, the Roadmap Council and Cigar? It's not that long, Cigar. <laughs> we had Avalon and Oh yeah, yeah. That's an innovation to Cigar because there are extra A's for Avalon and uh, Haiku. Otherwise, <laughs> it stands for. We should tell them what it stands for. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is good. Yep. The special interest group for Avalon. No, advising Hyrex roadmap, but advising like, Avalon, advising Avalon Hyrex haiku roadmap. Yeah, <laughs> it sounds good. Okay. Um, oh, we already talked about this. And, yeah. Okay, this is our last slide before our break, uh, just to give you an update on where we are. Um, so, in terms of how to influence the decision-making process, we all want that, right? We're Americans, or, <laughs> or Brits, as the case may be. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, maybe some. Oh, Canadians! Thank you for coming south and visiting with us. We need you. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> so um, we've talked a lot about the interest groups, but that really is a great way not only to find out what other people want and find out if they're similar to your wants and needs, but just to sort of um, sh find out what's going on and find the find out where, like, how you can collectively um, get movement or traction or get on board with stuff that may already be happening um, to, you know, to see your need through. Um, repository managers, of which we are members, is one, one place. The metadata interest group is actually, um, you know, we often have to touch bases with them. I think work types is a, an excellent example because there are, um, 
I mean, the metadata interest group is a very strong group. They have excellent people running that show. They are really like methodical and meticulous with their work, as all good met metadata people should be. And uh, I think it's you know we're lucky to have them to help us make good good metadata in our repositories. But um, in the case of work types, for example, you know we want to we want to do that in, in in a consistent fashion within the within the, the code and our community. So um, some of these groups are really kind of work in tandem and have important touch points. Um, and then the user experience interest group is one that has. Um, I would say it's gotten. I mean, it's been it's been going for a while, but I think it, I've, I've observed some um, particular kind of power. I would say over the last couple of years, partly because we have this shared online instance of Hyrax, um, so it's and they lead that some of the testing there. So it's possible for us all to work together on testing and um, changes to the Hyrax code base in this case, and. Um, and, and you know, reflecting on the user experience in addition to whatever just kind of technical issues, underlying technical issues we might come across. Um, and that's something that they've really led and helped, helped make happen. Um, as Nabila was saying, that there are some working groups, and so these are kind of spin-offs that sort of have a short timeline. Um, these are, uh, one of the, the places that you'll see these are, um, in, they're focused on specific features as they're getting developed. So, the collections extensions, one that happened last year, um, was, was one such working group. And then I put the specialty working groups, I think they might be interest groups actually now that I look at it. Um, but these are for particular just general interests, right? Like, I'm an archivist and I work in San Vera, where are the other archivists? Um, where are the people who are interested in geospatial? Um, and so the point, the reason I, we put this under decision making is that, you know, stronger together, you know, the, the strength of numbers. So if you're with your people and you've got your, your, your you've got an agenda to push together, um, you're more likely to be able to make something happen. Um, and the distributed usability research team is a working group of the user experience interest group. Again, this is the folks uh, that help do a lot of the testing for major new releases. On, on Hyrax in particular, but maybe other code bases that I'm not aware of, actually. Um, and then, of course, that's all kind of ground level work, right? But then there's the option to become a partner. Um, and obviously, you know, that's a, that's a bigger deal. It's all spelled out on the page on the wiki called Severa Community Framework. Um, it starts by uh, letting somebody on the steering committee that you're interested, that your institution is interested, and then things kind of go from there. Um, but w once you're a partner, you are able to uh, participate in some of the, the kind of high level uh, community decision making and help see some of the, the community work going forward, which um, is very rewarding, I should say. Lots of, lots of work to do there. So uh, the more the merrier. And then um, just participate in discussions, and you know, make your voice heard. Um, I think, and, and you know, it says everywhere, and that's because there's a lot of discussions happening, whether they're here at the over the coffee table, um, there's they're on Slack, they're um, in workshops. I mean, as we said, there's lots of opportunities for for having these conversations, and if and if you don't participate, then it's you're not you're not seen. So. Um, I think that's it for our slides at this point. Does anybody have any questions about this or anything else about the activity or before we go into the activity? Yeah. Uh, we've had some discussion at our institution about developers needing to sign a kind of release agreement mm -hmm. in order to participate in community. Can you, can you talk about that and explain I can, and there is information about this on the on the wiki as well. Um, and I may not know as much as you. I'm looking at you, Steve. But um, there is a uh, it's called a CLA, and it's a license agreement for coders who are contributing um, code to the repository. And this is an important or into the Samvera code base in general. This is important um, from a legal point of view, as you can imagine. Um, 
And nothing can be accepted, uh, maybe this is getting back to your, one of your questions, Sadie. We can't accept anything into the, into the, the, the shared code um, by a developer unless they have a CLA. Um, so that's one, that's one level. But um, my understanding is that it's a fairly straightforward process. Um, you just, it's, it's, a, it's some paperwork. We do it for everyone on our team that works on Samurai projects, even not developers, which we figure like that covers us if we write documentation, whatever. I don't know if it really matters for that, but it's, it's signing one piece of paper and scanning it and emailing it to someone. So. Yeah, I would recommend that if possible. Um, and we I do mean, it for our institution too. Right, so that's the other thing is there's an institutional CLA also, which may be the thing that's a little bit harder to get through because you usually have to talk to a lawyer, which 17 months later, you have an answer. But um, those are kind of the two main things you need, an institutional CLA, and I'm looking at Chris because he's been around longer than most of us. But the institutional CLA and then, and then the kind of contributor CLAs, and I would recommend getting everybody on your team a contributor CLA. I mean, I submitted my first pull request against Hyrex like a month ago because there was a misspelling of a word on the, the template for the issues. And that requires a CLA because it's in the shared code base. Um, so even little things require a CLA. Have you had or heard of cases where um, institutions did not want to um, allow developers to sign the, the CLAs? Because we, we have a couple of developers who kind of went through the process in the past, and so we're not we're not going to ask any questions on their behalf about their status, but bring new developers in, we may need to ask those, so we may need to go to the lawyers, and we've heard that there may be some, some conflict with Duke's own policies on, on people being able to share their work that way. Yeah, I think one of the things, and Chris, maybe Chris will speak to this, but one of the things is that I don't think you lose rights to the code. You essentially give a forever license to the community to use it. Uh, yes, so the, the CLAs are done, taken, they're basically taken from the Apache model um, and with very minor adjustment because we figured well, if it's worked for Apache for that long then it could, it could work for us. Um, we have had a situation or a couple of situations where institutions, the lawyers have not felt comfortable with what was stated in those and what it is doing is actually it's granting a license to the code elsewhere. Um, and. The way we got around it, um, I, I don't know the actual term, there's a thing called a submarine clause or something like that, which allows that, what it means is the institution in sense, uses another third party organization to hold the rights in the code, and then the license goes through them instead. And I, yeah, it's pushed my legal knowledge when we got that far down that line. But a solution was found uh, which met with concerns that institutional lawyers had raised. Um, but that was, I think there was one, maybe two cases of that. Everyone else seems fairly comfortable with it. Right, and I think this speaks to communicating with the community, right? You're finding issues with general counsel, your institution, talk to other community members about ways that institutions may have gotten around these issues and, and we could probably figure something out. I think um, Jessica pro could probably talk to this like with more experience, but because uh, you see San Diego, but the way on this, but um, UCLA does not like to take anything from any other UCs, so we have to do it all over again. Um, so even though it's UC, there UC says BSD, surprise, surprise, Berkeley software you know, as their license, that they, that's the only one they go with, and so they won't take Apache. So we're just, we're, I basically put it in what Hollywood calls turnaround, as like, okay, we'll come back to this later. So just for some of you should know, that's, that's just an issue with different campuses, and there's a, a precedent, and that's the way they like it. It was a long fight. You can do it. <laughs> Power to the coders. <laughs> I 
just going to add to back up your point there, is it's, it's, uh, um, in the, the use case that I mentioned, I don't know, it was UCS, UCSD, and I, I know it's Jessica probably well knows. Um, and uh, it did take quite a long time, but at the same time, what helped ease it along was that there was continual open discussion between UCSD and Samvira Steering, in order to add Duraspace, who acts, does a lot of the legal management for the CLAs for Samvira. And that dialogue at least meant that there were no hold-ups um, outside of where the lawyers were. But as a, as a community, we were working together in order to find a solution. That was the key. Thing. Thank you, Chris. Okay, anything else before we have a 10 minute break? Okay, we're gonna take a break and come back and do an exercise. Thanks. Okay, I think, is this on? Yes. I think almost everybody is back, so and we, given time, we're gonna get started. Uh, has anybody here ever done the one, two, four, all exercise? It's a format for doing a activity. Okay, I'm gonna explain it anyway. It's good to know if there's people here with uh, experience. Uh, there's a really cool website called liberatingstructures.com and they have different ways of running workshops and activities with groups and this is where I learned about it. There's lots of other really good things there, so check it out sometime. Um, so what we want to do today with you is go through an activity where we're sort of exploring the, the information that's available to us in all of the places that Samvera uses to record and share its information. Um, so we can kind of see what it's like to, to do this. And I know we sort of do it already. Many of you probably have already gone through this, but the idea is to sort of do it, but stepping back and looking at it through a different lens. Um, so we can kind of reflect on well, how, how do we engage with the community through the information and channels that are available to us? What are the, do we see any barriers or, and what do we bring to the process? And like how, so I'm hoping this, this will be sort of insightful no matter how new or veteran you are to this community um, in kind of figuring out how to kind of navigate and be a part of the community through the, the ways we, we share and, and, and document information. So that's, that's sort of the background, the goals here. Um, the one, two, four, all exercise, um, I'll, it's actually laid out on the next slide. So basically the one means you're working on your own. Single, single work. We'll do that for five minutes, and I'll explain this with the work itself in a second. Um, then you're gonna pair up with somebody, that's the two of one, two, four, all. Um, and you're gonna pair up with somebody who picked your same topic. I'll talk about the topics in a second. And you're gonna compare the notes that you, you know, what your work that you did in that, your private five minutes, and, and work some more together. Then we get to four. So two pairs get together, and you talk about what you did, what you found, and then we'll do that for about 15 minutes, and then we'll all come together and just kind of reflect and share what we learned. Um, does that process make sense? We can remind each other as we go, but okay. So the topic, or sort of the, the activity itself, is, oops, okay, yeah. Um, so there's three kind of technical efforts or topics um, out there in Hyrax land <laughs> um, that you may or may not have heard of. One is bulk import-export or batch, sometimes it's referred to, maybe a clue. Um, <laughs> another one is Valkyrie. I mean, Valkyrie is actually different than Hyrax, but Hyrax is, well, you'll find out. <laughs> you can do your research and tell us what Valkyrie is. Um, and then there's analytics, which Hopefully you all know what we mean by analytics. Um, so pick one of these topics, and, we, and for, the, for the exercise to work, we need at least four people on any one topic. So take a minute to think about which one you want to pick. And then I'm gonna ask for a show of hands just to make sure we have everything covered. Um, and we put these on the board because I think after we do our private work, our, the one of one, two, four all, we, it probably makes sense to gather um, in these corners of the room, and so you can find pairs and then your foursomes. 
Um, sorry the room is not actually that conducive to group work, but we'll, we'll make do, right? Um, anybody have questions about the process? Oh, I think I think Steve and Bila and I are going to participate and do it ourselves, um, but we will be available to, we're going to time, and if you have questions, just shout out, okay? Okay, so can I see a show of hands for people who are going to do the activity on Valkyrie? Okay, got enough. Analytics, got enough. Both imports, export, we got enough, great, okay. <laughs> Um, <laughs> cool. I hope this is fun. I think it'll be. I think it'll be an insightful process. I'm. I'm looking forward to figuring out, seeing what we figure out. So, okay. I think for maybe for the private work, we can just sit where we are. Um, I'll start the timer for five minutes, and then we can then we can uh, pair up. Okay. But it sounds like everybody had some good discussion. Um, so I guess I'm just going to facilitate a group discussion. I wish we could all be in a circle. <laughs> <laughs> this is a weird room. So, and I'm not a teacher, so I'm not used to this. <laughs> Anna, can you just, is it possible to repeat or should we just try to pass the microphone? I'll repeat. Oh, no. I'll pass the microphone. Maybe, maybe my, I'm not as important as a voice. Everybody just. Anyway, <laughs> um, so uh, what, do you, what do you think of this process? Can you, do you have any kind of collective or kind of summary insights into how one discovers and explores a topic in San Vera land? Anybody wanna? I know this might be jumping ahead. I know this might be jumping I love the microphone, it's the best. Uh, I think it might be jumping ahead, but I, just having a conversation with somebody else that I just from another institution and over the same subject, we found all these alignments that we then started talking about. Like we both have Postgres backends and want to talk about that in terms of Valkyrie and what does that mean? Um, and so then we were trading back notes, and she was like, "Oh, let me look at your you know your code base on GitHub," and we talked about you know just some of the things. It was it was it very quickly winnowed down to exactly what I wanted to talk about, which was unexpected. Hey. <laughs> yeah. So just by talking to this Another happy customer. <laughs> That's great. Anybody else have insights into this process? Kate? Yeah. Um, so Following that thread, I was able to find a fair amount of stuff on my own, but certain questions that I had about like implementation roadmaps and just various other insight, uh, I was benefited by a from a larger group, and I was specifically also benefited from the long one that I had with the uh, person I was talking with because, among other things, um, they had deep knowledge of this tool, but they also had deep knowledge of stuff like cigar and roadmaps and, oh, I was on a call with, with this group and that came up and it's like, that's really helpful because, you know, I don't read all of the release notes all of, or all the meeting notes. When you can, it's really helpful to, as, as they put it, winnow it down to exactly what you need. Um, so having varying levels of participation and engagement at higher and lower levels is really helpful. Excellent. Oh, you got one. Yeah. Yeah, I got one. Uh, one of the things we found with analytics was that it was very easy to get to a place on the wiki where there was a lot of documentation and you kind of felt like, oh, I found it. But then when you were looking for specific pieces of information, sometimes it was harder to navigate and just kind of the general state of things. You could kind of see the history, but you couldn't tell what happened. And there's like the last meeting notes were from December, but then Steve told us things really fizzled in April and we were kind of like running couldn't figure it out and we kind of went to a different a couple different places um, and so one of the things we talked about as a big group was like a little kind of summary of every group at the very top that could just have like a uh, quick at a glance who's the facilitator when's the last time they met where can you see any implementations or where's the sta status of the stuff that is a brilliant idea that was Steve's idea I don't want to take it <laughs> 
Yeah, that was one of the reasons I thought analytics would be good because I had been following that because that's something that Stanford's really interested in. And I was aware that there was this drop off and I thought, oh, it'd be interesting to see what we find. So that's cool. Uh, I'll reflect one thing um, from our discussion on the bulk import export. So um, some of you might know that Hyrax already supports a batch upload, basically a batch item create or work create. Um, and, so, and that's actually documented in the, the kind of standard Hyrax documentation. Um, but that's not the same as bulk import export. The, there's just a current effort now under, you know, in planning and soon to be, to be developed. So, but you wouldn't necessarily know that. Um, and so that's like yet another, you know, just another example of how things might not always be what they seem or you just might be missing some information and that you really need to get into the conversation to find out like what is actually the current state of things or how are things different. Words fail alone. Sometimes you know you need people to explain stuff. So. So uh, one thing I want to share from our group uh, was how did you find, how does one find information and uh, about like participating. There was one thing about mailing list. So if you are subscribed to mailing list, I think Kate brought that up, uh, tech mailing list, because um, the meeting notes are emailed in those groups as well. So then you will find out about those uh, meeting notes. And I think it's good to let the working groups know that you read the notes or you received it because it's, it tells them that somebody is getting the notes and it's very That's a great notes. point. Yeah. Yeah. So, just to keep up that. Uh, for one, one final pearl of wisdom. So to Hannah's point about, and to the analytics point about things just sort of disappearing, um, this is a super important reason why we have product owners for most of the solution bundles and for all the core components now. And I would say that if something seems to have fallen off or disappeared, that's the person to contact. And I think you guys have that on the board right there. <laughs> contact Steve. Um, because because the, the other thing that happens if people don't get in touch is that they, they go off and start building something themselves and may not know about for instance, a conversation I had last night at dinner with two other institutions about um, bulk import export implementation and plans. And so, so like that conversation is not at the point where it's documented. It's still kind of up in the air, but it's happening. And anybody else who's interested, like we, we're going to get to a point very soon when we want to start documenting that process. But sometimes these conversations are very loose and um, not that they're closed off, but they're kind of quiet just to keep people talking about it initially. I was just noticing over here under Valkyrie that one of the points they recorded was GitHub and maybe the wiki didn't have good enough. Yeah. And so you don't need to finish that sentence, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that um, I also went to the Hyrax repository to look for anything about that, and I didn't see anything there. And I think that it's not the first place to start is the point I'm going to make, that it, definitely going through the wiki and Google Docs is where you start. And then only when you feel like you have a handle and understand where things are in a development roadmap or pipeline, then the GitHub itself will help you see, like, I don't know. I, that's just based on my experience. That's like where you go when you really feel like you have a handle on where things are. Then you can understand the issues that are documented or, or not, as the case may be. My experience. Is that enough for, for this? Okay. Okay. Okay.
so the next topic we have is uh, when we are working on a repository, it's not for ourselves only, it's mostly for the stakeholders. There are so many stakeholders in there, right? So uh, we'll share a few thoughts we have on this. Yeah, so when you are working with stakeholders and once you have uh, the feedback from the users, uh, what are the possible scenarios that can happen and um, uh, how do you respond and when is it safe to say no? Now I'm thinking, can I, we're gonna talk about something on this, do you want to? Uh, oh, that's, yes. if you want to. Um, I just wanted to share, well, I say no a lot um, <laughs> in my role as managing uh, aspects of this, of our repository system, um, partly because uh, we have a lot of different stuff going on and we're not actually actively developing the front end self, uh, the self deposit application to our, our repository right now. We haven't been for several years. And as you can imagine, a lot of ideas and requirements and, and um, use cases come up um, in our like ever dynamic library and, and you know digital collection landscape. Um, so I say no a lot, and <clears throat> it, it's really hard. Um, I actually it's, read a, a an article last night that was assigned for this other discussion group I'm in. I'm going to pull it up. Hang on because it had advice on how to say no, <laughs> which I thought was good. Uh, Are there any questions? Uh, anybody wants to share any thoughts? Yes. So uh, I think one of the things that I've I'm trying to get away from inside my own organization and dealing with Sambera. How can I not get that thought? You were able to do it. I have the other thing. Oh, okay. Um, so one of the things, oh, maybe that's better. Um, one of the things that uh, I'd like to get away from is the concept of requirements. Like this whole must have this and start to think about, here's what we have. What would we all like to put our chips on You know, for the next six weeks? And just like, let's build this together, create more ownership, share a community, and the concept of, hey, I put my chip down for you for six weeks. Could you put your chip down for me this go round so that we can build this part that I'm really interested in? And I just think in the environment that we're in where there's so little of the big, you know, beautiful thing that everyone wants, creating that dynamic environment is a good way to change the no, um, to change it into something different. I really like that idea. That's a, that's sort of revolutionary in a way from most like you know, traditional approaches to product ownership or management. Um, before I read this thing that I was going to say, just what you said reminded me of we. One of the things that we do at Stanford, and, I, and I've talked about it here before, so apologies if if you've heard me say this before. But we, um, for some of our different kind of functional areas related to digital content management, we we've organized what we call service teams, and so they're they're kind of core stakeholders that you want to kind of bring into your circle and develop this sense of shared ownership with um, and. The idea is that they can become sort of liaisons with your product or whatever it is you're, you're, you're shilling. <laughs> um, but so sort of help, help understand why it's working the way it is or what's coming next and sort of be able to advocate collectively back with their liaison or their peers in other parts of the library or the groups that they work with, their constituents. So, um, and that's, it's been relatively successful, you know. Um, anyway, so the key points I got from this article about saying no as a product owner was, um, like, being able to, often you'll, you'll, you'll get a lot, especially if you're ramping up something new and you're, you, you want people's input, right? Because 
That's what you need in order to be successful. But um, you'll, you may get more than you can handle. <laughs> um, and so, you know, this, this article was providing guidance on um, don't give like 10 reasons why you can't do that for them now because um, they will find of the 10 or five or whatever, you know, more than one that you gave them, they will find the one that's weakest and, and, and drill you on it and, and call you out on that. So just pick one, a good reason, and stick with that. I thought that was a really interesting idea and I'm, I'm looking forward to <laughs> applying it. <laughs> um, be empathetic and appreciative. I mean, I think we all sort of know to, to do that, um, but it's, it's good to be reminded. Um, conveying that we're all kind of, we're all in this together. We have shared goals. Let's, you know, and that's sort of like what you were saying, Liz. Um, and also explaining the consequences of saying yes. And I mean, the idea here is that we all have more work than we can do. A development team has already been assigned to work on X. If I say yes, to your why, then the impact is at Z, you know? And be, but being able to explain that in a way that, that your stakeholders can understand is hard, but is an important thing to be able to explain to them just why you're saying no, what the consequences are. Um, so that was a good reminder. And then it also said, you know, see if you can find an alternative for basically softening the no you know, some alternative to keep them happy, but I think that gets dangerous quickly, depending on your situation, of course. Um, so, and it also cautioned against that. So, anyway, I thought um, those were some interesting ideas that I wanted to share here. So, anything else on user input or feedback? Here, I'll come with the good mic. <laughs> uh, I was just gonna say one of the things I often do is have all right there so oh. she's very familiar with this that I'm going to be talking about mostly me pre uh, presenting things to her but also to our entire team um, is like having a list of all of our stories in a priority order so that if I get something new that they want they like, they see specifically everything else goes down and like you were kind of saying the consequence of that is these things don't get done but having it very visual is is very nice and it very like uh, very easy to get to in the middle of a conversation like oh let me just pull up that board you can see it um, and the other thing that I use a lot to say no, which is both a nice, easy way to say no, but also kind of sucks in terms of development and like moving forward, is that a lot of our projects are grant projects. So they have things that are more important in a specific timeline because we promised we would do it in a specific timeline. So I can say no, I can't do that because I have these six other grant projects but sometimes that means I want to do this other thing more, and I think right now it's more important, but I can't because of that. So that's a kind of a double-edged yeah. thing for us. Yeah. Grants can be double-edged in that way, for sure. <laughs> Anybody else on this slide? I have one sort of general thing that we do, which is double-edged also, which is that we publish a Gantt chart publicly to our organization, showing all the things we're working on for the next three months. Um, which means that we get fewer requests for new projects, but it also means that people are afraid to ask us for projects. Um, so we're kind of working through that now. But it is useful to kind of illustrate why we say no, or why we say no to certain features for certain projects. So. Yeah, so we use Trello board for that purpose. And we have, it, it provides a transparency, like what are all the projects we are working on. So when other divisions, they request for something, they can see what are the, all the other things we are working on. So that kind of let them know why we are saying no now, and it's gonna be done later. I think that helps. Okay, so now is the time for our next and the last activity. This is about expectation management. Um, like this relates very much to like why are we saying no? You know, I mean, no. Why are we saying no now? Is it for now only, or it's gonna be later? Or it's gonna be never? You know, when is when is that gonna come? And also thinking about like if we are working on a project, then how can we communicate with the stakeholder? Uh, going back all the way back to the initial slides, like what are the extra challenges that comes up when, uh, when we are working in uh, open source community? 
So uh, the activity we'll be doing, it's um, racing matrix. Are you, I know many of you are familiar with the racing matrix. Okay. Um, this is, uh, so RACI stands for, uh, uh, okay, Steve is passing those out. RACI stands for uh, Responsible, Accountable, Supported, Consulted, Informed. Informed. Thank you. <laughs> so um, uh, the activity would be, like if you're working on a project, if you think of all the people who could be involved in your project in any capacity, then uh, you write down their names, with possibly their titles could be another thing you can write down. And then you think of, is that person responsible, accountable, supported, consulted, or informed? And uh, today, the way we're gonna do this, uh, the way we're gonna do it is we will think about two scenarios. So um, let's read these scenarios. One is that you are setting up a repo or, so it's either we talked about like the green field of migrating, any of those things, and you are working with the community. So everything you add, you're thinking of the community, uh, talking to somebody in the community, and that's how your timeline is affected. The other one is there is no community involvement. So you are just like your own group and you're just working with that. So how would the RACI matrix look different? So we want to divide the group into half. Are we telling who is doing what? Right here. Okay. Okay. So this half of the room is which one? The first one. What? And that half is? Without. Without community involvement. So work together. Work together. Yeah, I think let's, let's do that to for oh. the so each half of the room break into two groups, and then within your group work together to build a racing matrix for your scenario. Does that make sense? There will be four groups, but two scenarios. Just to get into groups that are more manageable. And uh, we'll do and this for 10, 15 minutes. Yeah. yeah, so that we get a that. And if you don't have one of these sheets, uh, let me know. Okay, how about we start sharing files? So we get, we want to hear from all the groups. We'll just uh, share out for like five to seven minutes and then um, just wrap up because we are almost getting to noon. So we just want to hear from you. How was the experience? What did you find? Anything you want to share? I'm coming. Here we go. I'm coming. Gosh. Here we go. Yeah. OK. okay uh, the first thing that we seemed to notice right away is that there was, we thought that there was a person missing, and that was administration. Because so often, we can do something, and then if administration isn't in the matrix and then they get in the matrix, it can really either implode or explode depending on how things go. So just, did anyone else? Talk about that? So the stakeholder in the is that you have to the project manager have to responsibility for stakeholder. Stakeholder is a key group uh, in our uh, metrics is kind of only one of you, you need a lot of level of project management to handle the stakeholder. And uh, as you know, the future is most important uh, in the you know, stakeholder. You, you have to define the level of a stakeholder, what kind of stakeholder is needed to be a, um, uh, you include a high level or just to inform. Uh, you have to define it. But, uh, because of the, 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 uh, this metric is this kind of simple metric, uh, we, we cannot go that far. But uh, in, in basic science, is they're they're in the uh, uh, stakeholder. Uh, 
I would just say the same thing. I put the administrator as a type of, of stakeholder and just what, did you say it, Shin? Or Shin was saying like, and therein are like 30 different types of stakeholders, but they sort of all go in there. What she said. <laughs> And this is just one template. I mean, you can you know expand on it. I think the main concept is thinking about who is responsible, accountable, supported. One of the things we found was that there was kind of just in our own individual experiences and roles, there was kind of a difference between what project managers were responsible for. So some of the project managers were way more like technically responsible for like defining requirements and everything and sometimes they were more responsible just for like documenting everything and making sure people were talking to each other and things were progressing. And so we had a couple ones where someone was either accountable but or they were responsible because they were actually the ones doing that and that just varied from person to person. So one time, uh, I just want to share one time, uh, we used a template or a recent matrix where we wrote down all the possible titles for the stakeholder on the left and put R A S C I on the top. So then it was easy to just put across like who is responsible for this. And now that I look at this template, it's a little bit different. It's more uh, detailed. And actually the original one, um, when you put R A S C I on the top, that's where you want to make sure that accountable could be only one person, right? You don't want to make everybody accountable. They could be multiple responsible, but accountable is only one. OK, so thank you all for attending. And we just want to hear from you. And you will be receiving a form, a feedback form from Anna. Yeah, right now. She's sending it right now. So <laughs> um, we just want to hear from you. What do you think about about this uh, workshop, um, if you want to you know, just answer any of these questions. It requires sign in. Can you just ask? Oh, yeah. yeah, so I'll do that. OK. So even if you receive the email, you can ask for the phone. So in that case, if you want to share something here, please do.